um, the the breeding efforts towards the high density planting uh, require the breeders to produce plant types which are more compact, which are uh, synchronous uh, flowering, which have earlier maturity period and uh, a bowl size of somewhere around 5.5 to 6 grams wow. with very good opening because you know to mechanize the harvesting we need to have very good opening. So once we develop such varieties <laughs> please keep uh, all the video yeah yeah the, please uh, I think someone who is uh, handling the um, zoom yeah the video conferencing I think they need to keep every other uh, participant on mute when someone is speaking here please ensure that otherwise we'll have some funny noises coming up in between um, the next important thing after the we discussed about the plant architecture the next important thing the breeders will have to look will be in the climate change is a changing climate is another uh, component that is there in the climate change naturally you have more stress more uh, um, uh, abiotic stress coming into the crop we have long periods of dry dry spells we have again uh, heavy rains occurring after a long period of uh, dry spell in the same year in the same location we have um, prolonged uh, drought and also followed by a very wet period so the new genotypes what we breed they must have the ability to withstand such um, periods of drought followed by periods of uh, wetness so we need to have genotypes which can withstand uh, uh, the stresses due to excess moisture or low moisture both happening in the same crop period and uh, because of such erratic uh, climatic conditions the crop can also go through a lot of uh, biotic uh, stresses like you know fungal diseases uh, nowadays virus has become very severe the north has suffered because of clcv at the same time the south has suffered because of the tobacco streak virus so this kind of a and central zone so far is lucky but i'm sure something is going to happen there also with the factors of climate change new viruses might come and create more trouble so this is another aspect which the breeding uh, uh, teams need to keep in mind the resistance for the biotic and abiotic stresses particularly getting accentuated because of climate change the industry requirement on the fiber quality is most important cotton is grown only for the industry so we need to somebody raise this question in the earlier session also i think we can raise this question so the industry requires mostly the cotton with uh, something like 29 30 millimeter staple length and uh, with a strength which is uh, gtex which is matching to the length about 29 30 again and uh, micronera 4.5 to 5 so this is most required cotton a few capacities require uh, longer staple of 31 32 and few capacity requires even ELS cotton of 33, 35 millimeters. So nowadays the norm is the strength has to be matching with the length. The same uh, millimeter length has to be GTEx of strength. So these parameters we need to maintain. So with these few uh, remarks, the uh, the targets uh, set for the breeders, I would now, now request uh, um, Shivendra to take over and elicit the opinions of the breeders, uh, experts who are sitting here in the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rao. Uh, so uh, I think Dr. Prabhakar Rao has given a, a very uh, concise and to the point outline what are the challenges we have in cotton production and improvement of through breeding and what are the options that could be taken. So with this background, now I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Y.G. Prasad first. Yes, so uh, so how we are going to manage this is we'll have uh, we'll request every speaker to give their thoughts for five minutes, and then we'll have few questions and answers. Dr. Uh, Dr. Prasad. I load my presentation. Uh, good afternoon to the chair and then co-chair and all the delegates here and uh, those who have joined online. 
Uh, I'm making this presentation in the technical session on uh, revamping of breeding programs uh, for efficient use of genetic resources and a changing climate. There are two, three uh, terms in this uh, session theme that are very important. We are talking about breeding programs, whether it is public sector or private sector. You are talking about uh, genetic resources and again, changing climate. Uh, many of us have uh, really, <clears throat> in the since morning, uh, with the starting presentation of Mr. Kod Suresh Kotak, I think a lot of technicalities have made so simply simple by his presentation. Much of the technical session he has already elaborated so eloquently, and I really compliment his vast knowledge and then uh, depth of uh, technical knowledge, making it so simple for all the stakeholders. Followed by Mr. Chair, Chair of this today's session by Prabhakar Ravgaru's presentation on HTPS and what efforts the private sector is making. My job has been very simple, but I would like to narrate the public sector perspective of the breeding initiatives that we are vested with the responsibility of uh, generating new genotypes or steer, steering the release of uh, and notification of private sector hybrids and also the packages that we developed for uh, the climate resilience uh, for across the country. So next slide. So far, since uh, the introduction of BT, since the technology was not in the purview of the public sector, we started late and then we released so far about 19 uh, BT varieties, straight varieties, uh, which are generally of 150 to 160 days duration and about two to 2.5 ton seed cotton yield, which are specifically bred for uh, marginal soils, shallow to medium soils, where the long duration hybrids of 180 days are very productive, very robust hybrids may not find place. So these varieties are there, which are released and notified. And we have also entered into MOUs with, for seed production, entering into seed chain and all. But again, the preference for farmers is for BG2 hybrids than BG1. And also the preference is shifting towards BG2 coupled with HT. That choice is there by farmers and we need to make a shift towards that even public sector or private sector. The second is, uh, <clears throat> There is a significant shift of breeding efforts to compact varieties, which are early maturing. This trend has started 10 years back and now many of the seed companies, private seed sector, as well as we also, uh, mostly largely focus on developing of compact early maturing, which are less than 150 days duration with good bowl weight, jacid tolerance, and also uh, early maturity combining with good fiber property. These are the four or five parameters that uh, many of the breeding programs no compromise in fiber quality, at least 29 mm. Second is uh, big bowl, farmer preference, so that, and uh, which are amenable for high density. So that uh, uh, based, uh, instead of uh, relying on plant productivity, area-based productivity, when we increase the number of plants per row, the area, square meter area yield will be higher compared to individual plant-based productivity. So this is the significant shift towards uh, the breeding here, this one. And we have also developed some 16 non-BT varieties. Uh, many of you may not know that the significant research effort of public sector goes into development of non-BT. Of course, there is no much market demand or preference by farmers, but there is a very great scope for organic cotton, especially from India. 50% of the organic cotton production is from India. There is a lot of scope. And uh, uh, these are, again, these 16 non-BT varieties, the emphasis our breeding efforts are shifting towards compact and early maturing so that we make efficient use of the uh, soil and rainfall resources and also uh, ensure better productivity for the farmer. So this is again a shift which many of you not know, but these are their varieties which are released both hybrids as well as varieties. And also among the 19 BT varieties that we have specifically released, there are four BT compact varieties which are less than 140 days duration. And these are released for central zone of medium staple category, but they'll complete their life cycle. The cotton season can be closed, short, dense, very high planting, which could be one lakh plants per, per hectare. So that kind of varieties we have released and uh, these varieties are put in seed chain. Now. Next one. Next slide, please. And another niche cottons, especially extra long staple cotton, much of the private sector hybrids. Uh, Hirsutum hybrids as well as H2B hybrids are in market in four states like Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh and certain pa parts of Rajasthan and certain pockets in Maharashtra. But again, in this category also, a lot of public sector research efforts 
have contributed to the release of three ELS cotton varieties, which are pure Barbadian C varieties. Apart from Suvin, after a long time, we have released three notified and uh, released varieties and notified also three Barbadian C varieties, which are of equal quality or near equal quality to Suvin, the brand that we re released in 1974. So these are again on the seed chain and these need to be popularized. These are in non bt So they are uh, uh, fit for uh, say, and also nine H to be hybrids and six hirsutum varieties also have been released with better fiber qualities. And uh, apart from another segment that is, uh, which is forgotten or lost ground is the arboreum cottons, desi cottons, which were noticed for, known, known for their short staple, surgical cotton types, medium, short to medium staple cottons, which have lost ground to hirsutum because of yield. There are certain pockets in Gujarat, there are certain pockets in Rajasthan, North Punjab, Haryana, and pockets in Mar Marathwada, for example, in Maharashtra, and certain pockets where significant area is there for suitable for ar arboreum cottons. The main criteria for not preference is that the yield is low, and also the staple is much preference for market is by long staple cotton. These two concerns have been addressed by the research, public sector research, as well as the universities, and also the private sector, that now we have bred varieties which are both high yielding as well as long linked. Now, can you imagine a desi cotton variety of 29 mm or 30 mm? Now we have released varieties. In the last two years, we have released three varieties uh, by the All India Coordinated Research Project on uh, cotton, uh, which are for recommended for central zone. So these are their seed, uh, high, good mic and uh, long staple, desi cotton varieties are there. Again, natural colored cotton, naturally colored cotton. This is another segment which we can, we are much ahead. And uh, there are countries which are interested in an NCC varieties also. So this is again, four varieties have been released recently. In the last two years, we have released four varieties, which may not, many of you may not know. And these are a good spinnable varieties, 23 to 24 mm to 25 mm with good strength. And uh, these are in two hirsutum backgrounds and two arboreum backgrounds, and we're both recommended for a central and southern zones also. So there is a shift towards in the breeding that we need to really specialize, diversify cotton from just hirsutum to other kinds of cottons so that there is the growing demand can actually, we can catch the demand when the demand arises. Next one. Next slide, please. Then we all know that we, although more than 2000 hybrids are there, which have been released or notified, and uh, at least 50 to 100 are in circulation. And there is uh, always a concern by the industry that there is a plethora of varieties. There are problems in regulation, uh, inspection, and then quality, maintaining the quality of seed that comes to farmers. So there are some issues, but, uh, uh, so, but when we, uh, why, when we analyze the situation, why only some 50 to 100 uh, hybrids are very popular across the country? They have a very significant share. The major players in seed sector, there, uh, the parents are similar, almost similar, or the, there is a narrow genetic background. So this is not so desirable. So as a public sector research organization, our concern is of strategic nature. And we are really deeply concerned that we need to really diversify the genetic back, uh, base of our uh, public sector or private sector hybrids or varieties. So we have launched, ICR has taken a policy decision two years back, and we have uh, embarked upon pre-breeding as a flagship initiative for in all breeding programs of public sector. And private sector is also deeply involved in this. And we are trying to utilize the wild species, unadapted germplasms to widen the genetic base and create mapping populations and integration lines so, and share it with other partners, researchers or breeders, so that ultimately new traits with higher productivity or high good fiber quality or disease resistance or pest resistance can come into the market in the next five to 10 years. So that, uh, that shift has also happened. And uh, we are now sharing all our crosses with all the uh, private and uh, public sector. Then uh, there is again a very strategic uh, 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 research initiative which is in, in place, uh, which is a leaf curl virus tolerance in the North Zone. Because this year we have seen almost 30% of the area was affected by leaf curl virus. And last six years we have been doing a lot of research of screening the existing genotypes which have been released for North Zone for leaf curl virus and only recommending those hybrids which meet the criteria of 30% disease incidence. And this uh, strategy by the universities and ICR has played rich dividends in the North Zone wherein we have not seen much leaf curl virus, but the spread of uh, spurious means unadapted, uh, undescript, non-descript hybrids from other states to North Zone this year, uh, which occupied 30% area, has uh, actually dented the production in 
Punjab. There are several other factors apart from the quality of seed that we have. There are so many other factors that are responsible for dip in production or productivity. So there is again, <clears throat> uh, there are much of our research, which you may not be aware, is in supporting development of new no, uh, regulated events, which are in the pipeline for public sector. For example, Delhi University or NBRA or our own university ICR institutes, wherein we develop new transgenic events, whether it is BT or non-BT for pest and disease resistance. And uh, two, three years, we have done a lot of research in our stations, wherein we continuously evaluate the development of new traits for new disease or new uh, pest tolerance. Sometimes uh, our much of our efforts go into this. Uh, <clears throat> next one. There is again a shift in breeding programs, the All India Coordinated, Coordinated Research Project on Cotton, which is located at Coimbatore. We have 21 participating centers in the state agriculture universities. And now we have also expanded this to the private sector also. The private sector is also involved in evaluation trials, not only the public sector. So there is participation. There is again involvement of state departments of agriculture in monitoring and evaluation. So there is a stakeholder convergence here in terms of uh, the fast tracking, the release and notification of hybrids or varieties, new genotypes. So now if you see, we have taken a significant step two years back that we'll introduce a new trial wherein we'll promote compact hybrids or compact varieties in BG background, in a BT background. So, and uh, this, this has played a, a rich, is playing a, going to play a rich dividends. Apart from the existing hybrids that we have, there are new, uh, highly suitable, extra early maturing compact genotypes, which are going to be released and 10 entries are in the pipeline now. Uh, and also we are doing as a city CDR and others, and we also are doing a lot of under the companies themselves are doing a lot of uh, high, high density planting evaluation, because here when we have a plethora of hybrids, especially the farmer has a choice of going for long duration, robust hybrids and even in marginal shallow medium soils, which are not suitable or not suitable to the rainfall pattern. So in that case, when we give an option to the farmers that there is a compact segment and product profiling we do and testing and then generate evidence, field-based yield data evidence, that only should be the criteria to really either to reduce the number of hybrids or target those hybrids to that particular agroecologies. This is our effort and we are advocating this strategy, which will play a rich dividend in uh, uh, increasing the average productivity either at the state level or the national level. Next one. And uh, coming to this last slide, this is the challenges and priorities in before, before us. Some of them have already been highlighted. I've just picked up two, three. Uh, tobacco streak virus is another major concern which is going to dip the productivity, especially in the south zone. This year we have seen because of rainfall variation, drought and followed by rain and all these things and the other associated weed flora, parthenium and others. We have a very st strong uh, upsurge in the tobacco streak virus incidence up to 45%. And there is a lot of concern among farmers also. So this is another worry which we need to really uh, breed. Uh, uh, breeding efforts should be directed for uh, this virus resistance. And in the North Zone, again, leaf curl virus should be our top priority for the North Zone. Uh, again, resistance to pink bollworm is also very much desirable now uh, uh, due to breakdown of uh, BG2. But I must tell you here at this point that BG2 hybrids or BG2 varieties, whatever, BG2 in BT still is effective against the major insect pest of Helicoorpa. If Helicoorpa uh, tolerance is not there, definitely, then definitely a lot of many sprays will be there against in the early part of the crop season, square to flowering stage. And this year we have seen a, a very heavy incidence of Helicoorpa on non-BT cotton. So still BG2 is effective, although it is not effective against uh, pink bulwark. BG2, many of the hybrids are have jacid tolerance and also tolerance to uh, let us not uh, uh, debunk VG2. Still, we need to pursue till we have other traits introduced, other traits permitted into uh, whether it is herbicide tolerance or new genes. We should continue with the VG2 hybrids and stay still effective. And uh, and the another approach which we are not making much research investments into our breeding programs is the development of mapping populations, uh, exploiting the genomic resources genomic technologies for uh, and genomic association studies for marker assisted selection and breeding. This could really rapidly catapult to the faster pace of development of hybrids, which are very robust and then proven. This is happening elsewhere in China and others, other places. 
but here this requires a lot of financial resources. Uh, we need to really find resources that we can really uh, embark upon this kind of uh, breeding efforts and also genome editing approach also. It's again, the national policy has been in place and we need to align with the national policy. And then at CACR, we have a, a laboratory transformation lab, tissue culture, robust tissue culture protocols, and we need to collaborate so that we come up with, especially for fiber quality and climate resilience, drought and stress tolerance, a, genomic, uh, a genome editing approach is a very, it will pay quick results. And we have embarked upon it. We have submitted projects. If funding and collaborations are required, then we need to really collectively go into this particular effort to fast track uh, development of varieties or hybrids, which are with fi fine fiber quality and yield attributes. So this is my presentation to before you because I wanted to be talk about the technical things because already in the previous sessions, a lot of generalities have been discussed and the same points we are repeating. And I took this opportunity to educate or to inform, create awareness among you that what kind of research efforts, because much of the brick batting we receive. So I would I have taken this effort, I mean, the initiative to uh, create awareness among you that we do a lot of research that may not yield results, but is of strategic importance. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prasad. It's a wonderful presentation. Uh, very technical overview of uh, what's going on in, in Nagpur. Uh, I think uh, your presentation is a perfect uh, gateway to our next speaker. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Bhagira Chaudhary uh, from SABC. And uh, if Bhagirath is there online. Yeah, thank you so much. Sivendraji, Prabhakar Rao, sir. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I want to really um, convey my appreciations to um, all the stakeholders who are attending this very important World Cotton Conference. Um, I'm located at Jodhpur and I work very closely with farming community in North, Central and Southern part of the country through various projects on cotton. Um, Dr. Prasad has um, highlighted uh, many of the technological um, um, aspects that um, I would be deliberating in the uh, next five minutes of, of uh, my talk um, to the stakeholder here. Um, you know, I would, would like to, um, at the beginning, re-emphasize um, that the technology, uh, you know, approval and the technological intervention uh, through seed-based technologies uh, has been um, a very significant um, achievement, a transformative achievement in cotton production in the last uh, 60, 70 years um, of that you see it. Uh, in my questions to um, previous session, I highlighted that India actually um, harnessed some of these technological interventions, uh, not only with improving varieties, introduction of hirsutum cotton, uh, gossypium hirsutum and barbadens, uh, from the US and Egypt in 60s and 70s. Um, but I think BT technology in 2002, and um, this, as um, Dr. Prasad rightly said, uh, providing um, a broad based protection against American uh, bollworm complex, uh, targeting three important pests uh, of significance to cotton, has actually made very big uh, contribution to what we see today of 35 million bales of cotton. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion that why we have not been able to moving beyond 35 million uh, bales. But I really um, would like to stress uh, here that maintaining 35 million bales uh, from 13 million bales is a very gigantic uh, contribution achievements that we made our farming community, our scientific community uh, through national agriculture research uh, systems. And this huge public private partnership um, you know, involving the regulatory systems of not only uh, Indian Council of Agriculture Research, but Department of Biotechnology and Ministry of Environment and Forest through the Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee has been a, a momentous uh, time for uh, cotton production as far as the production is concerned. Uh, we all know that uh, we are not satisfied with this 35 million bales of cotton that we see today. Um, uh, but, you know, it was our cumulative complacence to the technology in the last 20 years that we are struggling to uh, break the yield barrier of 35 million bales of cotton that we produced. Uh, we did achieve, as um, you know, by 2013-14, India achieved uh, more than 550 
uh, kg lint per hectare of yield. Um, today, even in our northern part of the country, state like uh, Punjab, uh, we have a yield which goes beyond 800 kg lint per hectare. But you know, over the period of time, um, you know, we uh, have not been able to uh, uh, get the technologies that farmer needs uh, to really, uh, uh, you know, make a difference in uh, the yield of the cotton. I would like to, um, you know, this, um, the whole um, the co deceleration in cotton, saturation by from 2015 onward, and then we've seen the dip in the yield per unit area um, has been a very big, big challenge for all of us. And I believe, um, as Dr. Prasad rightly said, you know, of course, um, uh, we have issues with, um, uh, you know, the new technologies, but if you really critically look at, and Dr. Prasad has highlighted, and I would, would like to um, bring your attention to this one. You know, we have seen that since 2015, uh, though the pink bollworm infestation was initially identified by Dr. G.T. Gujar and Dr. Um, uh, Kesav Kranti sir and group in early, as early as 2013-14, we've seen massive spread of this particular pest across three cotton growing zones. So today, pink bollworm is prevalent, not only in northern part of the country, but central and southern part of the country. Everywhere you go, this is one of the very big problem that farmer uh, finds to um, uh, you know, tackle with. And it, it not only uh, reduces the uh, yield, but also we have seen huge quality uh, cotton uh, issues that are associated with the infestation of pink bollworm. This pest has become an equivalent of what we have seen with Helicoverpa armigera. If it had not become till now, it will become an equivalent of Helicoverpa armigera that used to consume 50% of the total insecticide applied in 2002 or prior to that. Farmers are going in that direction, which is causing huge problem, not only in the cost of production, um, the uh, price, uh, the income for the farming community, but also for textile industry and others that they are unable to produce the quality cotton. So, I think as a country uh, with different ministries, Ministry of Textile, Ministry of Agriculture, I think on war footing basis, we must do something to help farmer deal with the issue of pink bollworm. That's number one challenge that I see that are you know, immediately before us. And if we are unable to do something with pink bollworm, we're gonna have a huge problem with respect to even maintaining uh, this 35 million bale production annually. You know, pink bollworm is not a problem that, are, that is created by BT technology. This is a myth and misconception that being perpetuated, um, you know, across um, articles that I read in media. You know, pink bollworm being a monophagous pest, the pest that only feed on cotton. We have not been able to ensure that the farmer complies with this whole idea of refuse management. Since farmer were not uh, growing on BT technology, the mechanism that we have adopted that we were giving farmer, farmer BT and non-BT cotton seed separate in separate packets has also actually attributed to the problem that we have seen pink bollworm. Since this feeds on cotton plant itself, uh, for my textile friends, uh, this pest has developed you know, resistance to the BT technology. Had we planted non-BT, had we uh, used this strategy where you, uh, you know, have a refuse in the back, that means you're mixing non-BT with the BT, uh, packets uh, to the farming community, we would have could have avoided this problem. We adopted this technology only now, lately. Uh, you know, things are, I think, too late. Dr. Prasad highlighted the problem leaf curl virus. We have seen um, in 469 acre of the experiments and demonstrations that we are doing through our organization in collaboration with uh, CACR uh, and PI Foundation and other organizations. We have seen, as Dr. Prasad rightly said, 30% of the infestation of leaf curl virus simply because we had seen abundant uh, you know, population of white fly in the field. So I think the management at very early stage becomes very paramount if we have to maintain um, the production that we are looking at. Uh, Prabhakar Rao has mentioned about the tobacco streak virus in Southern Jones. Uh, it's emerging as a serious problem. We are um, not really taking cognizance of the problem that farmers are facing with this particular uh, uh, virus, uh, but I think it would, uh, you know, create trouble for us if we don't take very preemptive measures. I would like to also draw your attention to another big problem that we have been seeing um, across India in different uh, uh, experiments and demonstration that we are doing on pink bollworm. A ball rot has becoming has has becoming a very big challenge for the farming community. And as Dr. Prasad mentioned. Uh, that because of the erratic rain, rainfall and you see uh, in some areas because of um, 
high you know uh, precipitation than in other areas so we've seen ball rot problem not only in northern punjab haryana northern rajasthan but also central uh, central part of central zone like gujarat maharashtra and uh, way in the southern part of the country you know one of the projects that i would like to bring attention of the uh, textile ministry and the textile uh, participant is that pink bollworm since become a very big problem united states um, you know way back in 2002 launched this massive project called eradication of pink bollworm from the united states of america dr kranti will uh, also i think going to uh, share some of his thoughts but you know four technologies that were very significant in their deployment in the united states from 2002 onward and first you know they looked at mating disruption uh, this is a technique uh, that uh, we have been uh, we have not used but united states and uh, countries like israel have used it very successfully that you introduce this whole semiochemical the pheromone that's being released by a female to attract male uh, very efficiently so that you uh, you know you disrupt this whole mating of male and no, uh, and the female uh, and therefore you reduce this Uh, population of the pink bollworm in the field not only that you since it require a, a community approach uh, you would still find uh, areas where pink bollworm matings where the technology is not deployed so they what they've done is that they also release this sterile insect male moths uh, so that you know the populations uh, which are not being affected by mate, through mating disruption can be tackled united states and other countries have successfully uh, used not only bt but they got many new generation technologies that they are stacking not only that they are pre-mating genes uh, that we have right now with bolga 2 approved in 2006 and uh, as dr uh, prasad said it's very important that this would remain a foundation if we want to bring new genes for pink bollworm or we want to bring in uh, other technologies with re respect to the quality or for the weed management and finally you know i think you know popularization of ipm based uh, insecticide applications um organic is a great niche we must all support but we would like to uh, ensure that the farmer optimize the production uh, in unit area that he operates and i believe uh, use of uh, chemistry uh, is very very significant but how do you educate them that you know you follow this whole aspects of integrated pest management i um, would like to show you how we have been using this mating disruption technology Uh, in our experiments uh, we initiated this project in um, last crop season on uh, 300 acres uh, you know we use um, not only the trap that you see trap is for monitoring purpose but here we are using this technology in a rope uh, note for, uh, format where you have uh, pheromone being encapsulated when this note is being tied to the plant as you can see here uh, it releases this pheromone and it acts as a female which confuses a male and unable to find the female and thereby you can really significantly reduce the population of pink bollworm in the field today not only india nowhere in the world there no technology exist except what i am highlighting here that can help us to control pink bollworm uh, devastations that farmer has seen through our experiments we have been meticulously looking at data not only um, uh, you know the trap catches data but flower damage ball damage lockful damage quality of ball and yield estimation and some of the results that dr mai uh, sir who oversee this whole project um, that we have seen in our last kharif season um, over 300 acres of the plot in uh, maharashtra is that this technology can enables um, reduction in a percentage mating disruption by 90% you can see this in the uh, the field that we have seen we have also seen 50 almost 50% reduction in flower damage green ball damage and locule damage and uh, almost 500 kg per hectare additional seed cotton yield that we harvested these are the data that we got from uh, five of the cluster that we put together in nagpur area each cluster representing a 65 acre uh, of a community con con uh, uh, continuous basis uh, the community level approach that we deployed this year uh, in 2022 uh, 23 project bandhan we have 19 clusters as you can see on this country map uh, from north zone central zone and southern zone uh, we have invited uh, cicr dr dr prasad has visited many of our cluster uh, state agriculture representative uh, from pau from hau we just concluded northern indian uh, uh, seven cluster in north northern indian each of 65 acre largest field experiment that taking place in the country and we believe this technology is um, a very significant step 
uh, where we would need approach not only from seed sector, biotechnology, but also from textile sector that you have to come together, educate farmer. How do we have a community uh, level approach where you use this, either the gel format of this pheromone technology for mating disruption or for the PB node that we have been experimenting across India. So right now we got seven cluster in Northern part of country. We have, um, you know, both Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, two cluster in Amreli, Gujarat. We got seven cluster in Maharashtra. Uh, we got one cluster in uh, Telangana and two cluster in Andhra Pradesh. We deployed the PhD, uh, uh, our colleague who regularly monitor, and we would be very happy to present you uh, what we get from uh, you know the, ex the experimental demonstrations that we are doing on mating disruptions. Um, here are some of the knowledge resources that we have generated. We are touching large number of farmer community, massive farmer melas on these uh, clusters, and it's creating a cascading effect. Uh, people, farming community, extension systems, seed uh, supplier, now they know that there is something called mating disruption technology available in the country. These two technology, PV node and gel, being approved by the CIBRC in 2020, only two years ago. And I believe uh, in the years uh, to come, this technology would complement um, the Bolga technology uh, and enable India to help farming community save losses caused by pink bullworm. Here are some of the um, pictures of Dr. Mai, 77-year-old, uh, very active in field, has been guiding a team of um, uh, 10 PhD scientists who work with me uh, to see that we meticulously present um, and do the work uh, that can help country deal with the problem of uh, pink pollworm. You know, these are some of the testimonials that I'm sharing with you of our work that we are doing in field uh, condition. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm just done. I'm just done. Beside this, I would like to urge uh, particularly textile ministry that, um, you know, your say on the technology uh, can be a turning point um, as we are grappling to see that uh, new generation um, technology, whether genome editing or biotechnology uh, being approved in the country. I hope uh, the next generation BTHT uh, that, are, that is under consideration uh, now by the government of India uh, will see the uh, light of the day. We have seen farmers uh, growing unauthorizedly these technologies, uh, but as Dr. Prasad said, with unauthorized cultivation, you have seen lots of problem that you are getting genotypes that are not being approved for the different, uh, uh, you know, agroclimatic zones of the country, which is leading to the surge of other pests like white fly, and there is a problem with, um, uh, you know, the quality of the uh, quality of the cotton that's being produced. So I urge uh, ministries and the government that uh, look at the technology um, as an important component um, in reviving our. Uh, cotton production in the country. I want to thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. We'll be happy to answer if you have any question for me. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Bhagirath. I think uh, we'll come back to you during the Q&A session. Uh, sorry, I shifted the uh, schedule a little bit. Uh, and I invite Dr. S.K. Shukla, Director uh, from the Mumbai Institute, uh, Central Institute for Research on Cotton Technology for his presentation. So five minutes, please, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon to one and all, respected chair, co-chair, and uh, especially Dr. Vaiji Prasad, uh, Director CICR, and other delegates. Uh, CIRCOT is basically involved in uh, giving quality feedbacks to the breeders, scientists, and also carrying out the training programs uh, for uh, creating awareness among stakeholders and farmers for improving the quality of the cotton. I will not take much time. I will just give the, uh, our feedback. Uh, what are we getting in the quality in the Indian cotton? And how, where are the scopes for the improvement? So whatever points uh, Dr. Prasad had highlighted, those points I will slightly uh, rebut. Uh, like uh, naturally color cotton. First, let us come to the naturally color cotton. Uh, it is a uh, uh, technology per se. It's very good. But where are the uh, scope for the improvement? Uh, First, uh, we are seeing that we have entered into tripartite agreement uh, with uh, CICR and Dr. PDKB, Akola University. Uh, but uh, what are the issues that uh, in the cotton, we are not getting the right length, right strength, and right mic? Many samples we are getting of less than three mic, which is very difficult to spin. 
and second thing is that what we are noticing that uh, the because of its non bt cotton emergence of paste emergence of paste and diseases are very high so productivity is less at present uh, this cotton is not sustainable it is grown in the farmers field so we have to look into these aspects before uh, launching the technology in full mode and now coming to the arborium cotton so that uh, we are claiming that arborium cotton we have developed uh, having a uh, staple length 29 plus and mic 4 plus but uh, we have to ensure it fully whether it is really there on the field and second thing we have noticed that the bowl weight of arborium cotton is less than uh, are around 3 gram and that, that is creating problem for the farmers so we have to uh, uh, including length mic and strength we have to see that bowl weight is also around 5 gram plus so that farmers will adopt it easily now coming to the hirsutum cotton technology per se it's a very good it's uh, more than 95 percent cultivated in india but uh, first and second picking quality is excellent but we are uh, in several areas like in maharashtra and gujarat we are promoting it for third picking fourth picking and it is extended up to february march region the so third picking fourth picking we are seeing that the quality is very poor it's not even comparable to the first and second picking and farmers are mostly mixing first second third pick, third picking fourth picking cotton together while bringing to the market so that is causing overall uniformity problem mic problem and strength problem so we have to look into that early maturity where mature variety is promoted and having uh, the staple length uh, 29 mm 4 plus gram and uh, now coming to the this ELS cotton that we are uh, frequently telling that uh, length should, strength should be equivalent to the length uh, uh, in terms of their units uh, but uh, for ELS cotton strength should be much much higher than length uh, suppose uh, for we are looking into that Giza cotton and Pima cotton strength they ensure that it should be 40 plus or 43 plus for 30 33 34 mm staple length so we have to also see that als cotton which is short in india having right strength right mic and right length then only it will be promoted now coming to the another issue that gening percentage it is uh, it is also very important parameter uh, if we see the overall cotton scenario in India, our ginning percent is hovers around 34 to 35 percent. Many ginners uh, get hardly 33 percent, 34 percent only when they totally uh, calculate that how much cotton they procured and how much base they have farmed. But uh, if uh, we see the cotton grown in particularly, we have, I personally visited uh, four, five, six African countries. There we have seen that ginning percentage is around 38%, even from for uh, long staple cotton, 29-30 mm staple cotton. And in India, we have seen few uh, actually seed manufacturer, they claim ginning percent to the 38%, uh, 37%, but they could not maintain the length. So when when ginning percent is 38, length is below uh, 27 plus or 28 plus that is not being adopted by uh, spinners or geners. So what we have to maintain is that 38% gening percent, uh, maintaining the length and strength. If we are increasing our uh, gening percent to 38%, around 3% increase, that will overall increase 10% our lint productivity. This data is rarely known by the persons because uh, one uh, three kg cotton contributes one kg lint. If we are increasing three kg lint, we will be uh, actually substituting nine kg seed cotton. So if uh, we increase by 3%, 10% increase in productivity will be there, that will be equivalent to 10 lakh bales. And 10 lakh bales contribute to around 8,000 crore business. So that we have to see into that. And this uh, actually, uh, information has to be taken very seriously for development of new hybrids and varieties. Now coming to another point uh, that uh, uh, that we are talking that productivity is not increasing for the last 10 years, it is stagnant. In fact, it is decreasing year by year because of certain problems uh, and uh, we are not able to ma make much intervention. So, 
so now the scope is for development of amenable variety for mechanical harvesting in the several forum it is talked that mechanical harvesting is required mechanical harvesting is required but not many persons tell that mechanical harvesters are already in place in india but they are not able to be used because we don't have amenable plant, cotton hybrids and varieties in place so for that everybody knows that plant height should be 3 feet it should be actually amenable for high density planting system synchronized bowl openings should be there 15 to 20 balls should be there in plant uh, first bowl height should be at a significant uh, height level so all those things are uh, not been uh, present in our indian hybrids and varieties and if we are able to develop plants and varieties amenable for mechanical harvesting i am uh, i just assure you people that uh, our 80 percent problem will be sorted out like productivity now what i what i would suggest for all the delegates and stakeholders and especially breeders we should not focus on developing high yielding varieties our focus should be developing uh, varieties amenable to mechanical harvesting the high yielding will be taken care of itself so we should our focus should be development of uh, varieties hybrids amenable to mechanical harvesting so pest for a pink wall problem will be also taken care of because we are going to harvest only once and it will be over by december january so all these things are uh, major points should, which i would like to highlight here and uh, pink wall worm issue is talked much now farmers are facing also problem in the foreign countries especially us and egypt where we have seen in generis also they have system in place for quarantine of pink ball worm for cotton seed and insects that also we have to think of but because of technology is already in place in circuit we have developed technology for quarantine of pink ball worm in cotton seeds as well as stress and uh, trash and uh, other materials but uh, technology cost having some co associated cost operational cost is a major thing like around 50 rupees 50 per quintal is required for uh, treating our cotton seed that our generis are at present not in a position to bear that cost if spinning mills are really paying them definitely they will adopt the technology i think uh, these many things uh, we wanted to cover if any questions is there i would like to love i would love to take those questions thank you sir thank you for giving me opportunity uh, thank you, Dr. Shukla. It's a very informative uh, thoughts. Uh, and we'll come back with questions later on. Uh, now I invite Dr. K. Silvaraju, who is the Secretary General for Southern uh, Indian Mills Association, for his thoughts. Dr. Silvaraju. Yeah, uh, uh, good afternoon to one and all. At the outset, uh, I compliment City for organizing this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, uh, without getting into the details, I think my previous speakers have already highlighted, uh, you know, the need of the industry as well as uh, the need, what we need, where we need to focus on uh, breeding and all. Uh, I think to a certain extent it has been highlighted. Saima do has a Cotton Development uh, Research Association. City also has got a Cotton Development Research Association. City CDRA Mostly we are uh, concentrating into agronomy practices. And uh, while Saima CDRA, again, we are going to complete 50 years. And uh, we do maintain about uh, 700 uh, gem blossoms. Uh, and uh, we have uh, successfully distributing around eight uh, uh, cotton varieties uh, in different zones, including uh, Rajasthan, uh, starting from 27 mm to uh, even 37, 38 mm. And uh, we closely work with uh, uh, CICR, Nagpur, Darwad, CCI, TNAU, Government of Tamil Nadu in, in uh, producing different kinds of cotton and uh, uh, commercially multiplying also. And uh, uh, we also recently got uh, uh, license for about 13 uh, varieties, including one BT uh, ELS uh, cotton variety. And uh, we have developed a cotton which is uh, slightly even, I would say, superior to Pima Giza. And we are now planning for commercial multiplication uh, shortly. Uh, and we will be also commercially multiplying whatever uh, CICR or uh, Darwad, 
uh, they have developed and we do have uh, we also have developed uh, uh, naturally colored cotton which again we'll be taking up and uh, we have developed also uh, you know the uh, battery operated handheld kapas plucker uh, which has been now successfully uh, you know proved its efficacy uh, over 15000 machines have been distributed 5000 machine by uh, cotton corporation of india under csr and uh, over 10000 machine by government of tamil nadu i am extremely thankful to honorable minister of textiles who has already directed industry to uh, sponsor about 75000 more machines in the coming year uh, uh, for the pilot projects which we are going to take up and also some more uh, plots so this is about the saima cdra and the cotton uh, coming back to industry perspective on uh, bleeding uh, in fact as uh, sir kart uh, speaker mentioned uh, there is a huge gap in quality and quantity uh, mismatch uh, so we have been telling that uh, industry needs some cotton but whereas uh, the what is available in the market is something different therefore we depend on imports uh, and many of our brands they insist that you should use only this particular cotton then only we will place orders uh, the, therefore we are compelled to produce and many several years though they, we produce surplus cotton unfortunately 11% duty has been levied now that uh, thinking that if you look at the last uh, several years the cotton what we are importing are not produced in this country except one or two years when our when there was shortage of cotton we are uh, compelled to import and if you look at uh, you know quality uh, parameters even quantity parameters uh, you know we produce uh, throughout the country anywhere ranging between 28 to 31 mm which is uh, where we have excess but uh, otherwise if you look at our uh, requirement in ells we are totally depending on imports even fiber properties to be specific uh, uh, you know i will briefly touch upon only few major uh, varieties where we have uh, you know the staple length like mec lra mc5 lower sanga 6 we get anywhere length is around 27.8 to 28.5 our gtex is around 21 to 24 and uh, that is an icc mode i am talking micron air is ranging anywhere between 3.5 to 4.4 and the trash is about 3 to 4 and uh, short fiber content is uh, to the tune of 28 to 30 percent but what we desire is something else 28 to 29 and the strength if we need at least 25 to 26 and uh, breaking elongation we need around 6.8 to uh, 7.3 in fact if you take several cotton west african cotton us smart one usca uh, memphis uh, american fiber max australian and where uh, the strength is anywhere between and our percent we get higher yarn realization to the tune of 3 to 4 percent the point here is the farmer is losing because of uh you know the, our deficiency in uh, cotton breeding whatever i would uh, say this is where we not but another thing is you know after the introduction of bt cotton we introduced this bt technology only into triple cotton ranging from 28 to 31 mm now throughout the country we produce one this cotton so that's a high look on whatever cotton being supplied cotton seeds being supplied by all private seed producers this is what we have been demanding the government of course uh, dr prasad also was you know slightly passing uh, passing a remark on this particular thing industries worry we need to really look at which seed is giving lower quality lower yield uh, you know whichever has got a very big diversion uh, it should be you know stopped this is what we have been demanding and of course uh, this is my appeal to all private seed producers it should be voluntary one since you are all producing truthful seed there is no monetization on the seeds and also we do not have any data of all the seeds what is the yield what is the quality of seed this is another issue one more challenge what we are getting with the bt hybrid there are two challenges one is farmer he is forced to pay higher price for bt hybrid and uh, uh, second thing is now us department of labor has included cotton seed and cotton under uh, you know dvp 
PRA uh, list saying that we employ child labor. Now, organizations like Texposal, Saima City, we are extremely finding it difficult even for the government. Recently, they also visited. Uh, uh, you know, even there was a, an article last year, uh, you know, saying that uh, in cross pollination uh, purpose, uh, the child labor is employed. So we have to be very, very careful. My sincere appeal, we do have challenges on BT variety, but it is high time when the entire world is switched over to BT variety. We should also uh, switch over to BT variety, if not immediately, maybe in a period of five to 10 years, this my appeal to all seed manufacturers and the scientists. I think CHCR will 100% agree. And uh, as a policy, Saima CDRA, CHCR, we have developed only BT variety. Uh, uh, BT variety. And uh, if you look at uh, even the, the next step line, uh, our uh, Sankar 6, uh, uh, 27 to 29.5, there again our strength is 22 to 24. We need around 26 to 27 to meet export quality and uh, higher, uh, you know, value added products. Uh, you know, Brazilian cotton, USCA, uh, their strength is about 28 to even uh, 30. Grams. And other issues also there. The silver and I your connection is very good. Is, uh, an issue where we produce bulk. So, this one thing. And if you look at, uh, you know, uh, Bunny Brahma, that is about uh, 28.5 to 31 mm. Here again, you know, the comparable, uh, you have uh, Egypt. No, no, I will just finish in. Hello. Sir, can Hello. you please sum up? I think we are really getting late and your war connection is not also very uh, stable. Yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, uh, now, am I audible now? I will sum up. Uh, sir, it's not very good. Hello. Anyway, sir, thank you so much. I will come back to you with the questions later on, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now invite Dr. Keshav Kranti, uh, who is the Chief Scientist, uh, International Cotton Advisory Committee in the US, uh, for his thoughts. Sir, five minutes for the thoughts, sir. Thank you. Good morning. It is actually 3.12 a.m. Uh, here in the United States. So I might fall asleep and I might snore even. So kindly forgive me if I do that. Um, Mr. Chairman, sir, Lakshmi Pavakar Ragaru, Mr. Suresh Kotak, and colleagues. It's always a delightful and honor uh, to be uh, with you. I'll, I'll get uh, straight to the point. What is the globe doing to combat climate change? I mean, I can see uh, the topic. It is like revamping plant breeding programs. Um, there are three major concerns uh, which the globe is responding to all across the globe, many plant breeders. One concern it is, uh, it's about uh, erratic rainfall, which causes a lot of stress uh, on the soil with respect to soil moisture. So sometimes it is drought, sometimes it is a lot of water, which causes water logging. The second uh, major concern, it's on temperature. It's on global warming. It's about 0.5 to 1% uh, over and above the ambient. But then most of us also know that cotton can be very susceptible to temperatures, especially if the night temperatures go about 27 degrees centigrade, the pollen becomes sterile, bowls are small, and there's a lot of bowl shedding. So the world is very cognizant to this fact and they're responding. The second aspect of temperature is if the maximum temperatures, it's not the nighttime temperatures, I was mentioning about the minimum temperatures, if it would be more than 27. But if the maximum temperatures are more than 35 degrees, even then there's a problem. There's a problem again with the same uh, kind of uh, aspects. It could be, let's say like, uh, it's about the pollen sterility, and then uh, it's about uh, like shedding of squares and bowls. So the globe is responding to these two things in uh, uh, with, with various different strategies. The third important thing is uh, it is about biotic stress, mainly about uh, white flies and thrips. There are other concerns, but I'd uh, like to focus on these because there's a common aspect running across the world. Now, what is the world doing to combat drought, to combat this excess water? Uh, uh, now, uh, one approach is, it is roots. Uh, everyone knows that in the first 50 days of its growth, 
uh, cotton plants focus on root growth. It is, uh, it's, it's a peak period. By 50 days, uh, the roots are there deep into the ground. After that, there is growth, but still it is less. So on the 50th day, across the world, many of the breeding teams are looking at which are the most efficient varieties, which are the most efficient genotypes that have the maximum root volume, that have the maximum root vigor, and that have the maximum amount of suberin. The suberin is a carbon compound. It is known as a kind of a recalcitrant carbon compound, which gives, which provides a lot of resilience to roots. So there's a lot of work that is going on root volume. It's on root studies. So this is one aspect. The better the roots for the plant, the better is uh, going to be the plant resilience to combat drought, or in fact, even let's say like something like water logging. So on one hand, it is the roots. India, as, I'm, as far as I'm aware, there is not much of work on roots and plant breeding, and we need to get to it. If, if we want to combat climate change in a very effective manner, so we must focus on roots. Now, second, uh, it's extremely important to plan our breeding programs to ensure that we identify varieties which can still be able to flower and fruit and be able to retain good bowls with, uh, with the minimum temperatures of about 27 and with uh, maximum temperatures of about 35. So what, what do people do? Uh, the kind of steps that are normally taken across the world are that on the 50th day, of course, you examine for the roots and the root volume and how deeper it goes and how prolific it is. But the second thing is on the 80th day, the number of sympodial branches are the benchmark. And whichever variety has the highest number of sympodial, which are the fruiting branches, whichever variety or a germplasm line or any material has the largest number of fruiting branches on the 80th day. That becomes, that falls into the light group. Now there's one more criteria. Now all this is with higher temperatures and also like with ambient temperatures. The other criteria is, at the 120th day, which is a bit closer to the cutout point. Now, on that day, which variety has the highest number of bowls, which is bowl retention? Now, this is at both conditions, like I said, at higher temperatures and at lower temperatures, but which variety can hold the largest number of bowls on the 120th day, because that is closer to the cutout. Cutout is a stage where uh, the number of fruiting branches should be less than four above the topmost white flower. Anyway, so these are the three major criteria and the stages that the globe is looking at uh, to combat the first two crises. One is the, I mean, one concern, it's about, uh, uh, it's actually about the irregular rainfall and the soil moisture crisis. Second one, it's on temperatures. Now, third on the biotic stress. Biotic stress, commonly across the world, people are worried about the impact of climate change on white flies and thrips. So there's a lot of work that is going on, but with focus on biochemical resistance to these pests. It's, it's not about morphological. Morphological, the experience has been, if you breed for white fly resistance, there's a possibility that they might become, that this variety might become susceptible to jazz hits. So uh, there's, there's a lot much of work going on. And uh, it, in fact, the CRY uh, 51 AA of Bayer uh, is, uh, uh, is it supposed to be tolerant to thrips, which is good. So uh, India must start exploring some of those options. Now, in terms of uh, biotechnology, there are a few genes. One gene that comes straight to my mind is, it is called the phytochrome A1 gene that has been silenced through RNAi, which uh, like Professor uh, like Ibrahim Abdurakmanov, who is currently the minister in Uzbekistan, uh, this work is amazing. In a recent presentation at the World Cotton Conference, it was indeed heartwarming to see that one change, just by silencing one gene, uh, they were able to uh, get varieties which are able to combat not only drought, salinity, and a wide variety of abiotic stresses. So India uh, must either start working on it or it, it, it wouldn't be inappropriate to get this material from there. There are many other genes, uh, like the drought guard, which is in corn by Bayer, and I'm sure I heard a, a lot of, uh, 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 like a lot of reports uh, on the drought tolerant cotton, which is not yet there on the ground, but uh, 
it, it wouldn't be inappropriate to explore these possibilities to see how India can best utilize them. There is a lot much friends to go, uh, I mean, to go on speaking, but I think I'm asleep. So uh, like, thank you very much, City, for giving me this opportunity. And it's always great to be among friends uh, in India. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kranti, for uh, staying awake till late. Uh, I now come to the uh, next part where we'll have one or two questions to the panelists based on the based on the thoughts they have given. So I'll I'll come to Dr. Prasad straight away. Uh, Dr. Prasad, you spoke about many things, uh, among which uh, one of them was the high density planting. And uh, if I'm correct, you said that you have been evaluating many lines and uh, you said it might take some time to come up. So can you throw some more light on uh, what uh, your institute has been doing? Um, and if any districts or uh, states have been targeted particularly for HDPS? Yeah, we have actually mapped uh, the uh, districts uh, state-wise, which are uh, currently having productivity of 350 kg lint per hectare or lower consistently over a period of time, we have mapped them. Uh, these are uh, mainly in the states of Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Telangana. These are the three states which uh, have about uh, say nearly 3.8 million hectares, so which is amenable for, uh, but there are other pockets in other states also where HTPS could be very uh, amenable. Uh, we have listened since morning how HTPS can really transform our, uh, not only productivity increase, quality increase, as well as promote mechanization. Uh, so th those uh, this uh, already we have discussed. Some of the varieties that we are now embarking public sector, most, most of our research is towards early maturity, less than 150 days with the little bigger bowl, then jacid tolerance, and then uh, synchronous uh, bowl bearing habit and bursting. And with canopy management or without canopy management. So this, uh, we have released few varieties uh, in non-BT as well as BT versions. Uh, this uh, seed has to be multiplied. These have to seed chain, they have to enter into, if you want to make it large scale availability, there should be a demand. If there is demand, we, our job is to produce breeder seed. Other players have to chip in the seed chain, seed agencies, national seed corporation or private sector. We are willing to license our varieties. Whoever is willing to take them, we are working with Saima, we are working with many other players who are interested in varieties. That is one thing which can really take them to the farmer's fields. Second is, in the absence of, say, good public sector varieties in the variety background, in BT background, there are existing hybrids which are already released notified. Uh, private sector also, uh, since the pioneering efforts of CACR 10, 12 years back, wherein we did with compact early maturing varieties, a lot of 6,000 trials were they are done in four states, so eight states. So this concept has picked up this segment. 10 years back, the industry also realized and put much of its breeding line stacks in place like Nuzuvidu has done, Rasi has done, and many other players. Now we are now coming across many private sector, seeing many, and we also joined the evaluation of these hybrids. Uh, there is, uh, I mean, we need to, for HTPS to succeed, genotype is very crucial, along with environment management, canopy management, crop management. So these are two areas where we need to really, and identify the, locality, geography is also very important. We should not put a compact hybrid or variety in a very productive soil or with good productivity, productive and productivity enhancing rainfall. There are certain, certain agroecologies where productivity is very low. There we need to really popularize and this area is too large. So there are public sector or private sector hybrids. Many of them we have identified now in uh, trials, a lot of data is being generated as Telangana has gone ahead with about 8,000 acres. Two companies have, uh, and many companies have joined. I've recently attending many field days also, seeing the performances, generating data, uh, 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 documenting data. So we are fairly in a good position to roll out high density planting in a pilot, pilot area next year with all the participation of all the stakeholders and major participation of city CDRA as the ground this one. And, uh, uh, with the seed agencies, input agencies, because plant growth regulators are required, chemicals are required for canopy management, defoliants are required, machine resistance is required, planters are required. So a holistic plan only will take forward the HTPS. It's just individual efforts, which we have done 10 years back. We, we just replicate that, it is nothing is going to happen. 
they have entire value chain the industry participation buyback or quality assurance traceability branding whatever the entire plan is in place but how each stakeholder will participate in this value chain a uh, concept uh, not not in the first year at least in the second year and the uh, industry participation in a big way in this and the seed sector participation in a big way we need to really take it forward and the process we also need to bring in some of the varieties where seed cost also can be minimized so this spin strategy of existing hybrids or varieties which are available and the pipeline varieties where seed can be multiplied for large scale application these two strategies i think will take us forward in a value chain participation of all stakeholders with government support as well as industry participation this is the way forward that i foresee thank you sir thank you sir i think is collaboration is the key uh, my next question is to dr shukla uh, if he is here uh, dr shukla are you there uh, yes, 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 sir. I'm there. Thank you, sir. So, sir, uh, you mentioned about that uh, uh, you have given many feedbacks about the performances of the different technologies that you mentioned, different uh, types of cotton that you mentioned. So, what could be the attributes of public private partnership that can happen uh, for the cotton breeding program that you see are very important? Yeah, yeah. That uh, attributes, uh, I will uh, stick to myself on the quality aspects only. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing which I would like to highlight uh, that in the public sector, scientists are mostly working on several research areas. If we really need to bring out some uh, uh, such type of technology where it is amenable for mechanical harvesting, as well as uh, it is productivity increased, uh, a main team, it is required to uh, build a team of good scientists with only one task. Task should be that uh, he has to develop, deliver these, these things. So that is my uh, actually first response. And second is that uh, in the public private partnership, we are seeing that uh, many scientists complain that we develop, but we don't get credit. So IPR should be equally shared and uh, MU should be formed properly and uh, most of the focus should be given on the development of variety correct uh, varietal characteristics where gene percentage is high because farmers will only adopt uh, if it is uh, having three four quality parameters first thing is that bowl weight they always look for the bowl weight if bowl weight is less the harvesting cost is high so farmers won't go for if it is bowl weight is less second parameters which they look for that productivity aspects, how much is the cotton productivity? Third aspect, they look into that, uh, that okay, that uh, suppose uh, the cotton is uh, from uh, rain fed areas, they will see that how long they can prolong it. So all those things uh, need to be understand before launching the variety. And uh, another point is that, uh, that if uh, farmers are extending for uh, three to four, uh, third picking, fourth picking, see so quality parameters should not be uh, reduced to the significant level. All these things uh, need to be taken care of before uh, entering into MU. I am, and uh, they, what I feel that dedicated team must be formed unless in mission mode, unless otherwise we enter into a mission mode, it will be a regular feature that we will be every year, every year uh, uh, meeting together and discussing the problem and solution will not be coming. Uh, thank you, sir. I think it's uh, very important, especially about the collaboration and the respect for intellectual property. Uh, is Dr. Kranti still here or he has gone to yes, bed? You're still there. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank you so much uh, for being away. Uh, so you are now uh, in a part of this International Advisory Committee based in the US. Uh, how that committee, uh, ICAC, can help? Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned some of the plan and ideas. But how specifically ICAC can help uh, Indian cotton production programs? Yes, thank you for asking me this question. Uh, India is the founding member of uh, the ICAC. ICAC was formed in uh, 1939. And India, uh, of course, it was with the British at that time. And India was the founding member. And India has been a member. It has never defaulted ever since. And it is, it's a very strong member. So it is our duty. It is a bounden duty from the ICAC to see how best we can assist. 
one great thing about India is it has a huge talent pool of scientists. And uh, so therefore, we generally see uh, how best we can support uh, like this pool of scientists through any kind of logistics. It could be trainings, it could be uh, like any exchange of material. But I must reiterate here, uh, any global exchange of material happens only when our doors open. So it is what goes in uh, and then what comes in. India has been a bit tight-fisted uh, of late, especially from the public sector institutions. The more we share with the globe, the better it would be uh, because we'd be able to get excellent material from the globe, from other parts of the world. Uh, because if we are to combat climate change, at least all the elite varieties of the world should find their home in India so that we can test them. <clears throat> and this, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> I'm really sorry, I was down with COVID, so I'm just recovering. So uh, what is uh, most important is that uh, all these material that we get, uh, we must be able to check and see in, in terms of suitability, in terms of adaptability. And for that, the ICAC is always willing to help. It's, it's not only that. Uh, I mean, in, on, on any other front, it could be the trade, it could be you know, like on production. But one interesting discussion that I heard today, it was on branding. There are countries which have dedicated branding. In fact, Brazil has created a brand. It is called ABR. Australia, they have a brand. It is called MyBMP Cotton. And then United States has two different brands. One, it is called Field to Market. The, the second one, it is called the US Cotton Trust Protocol. And uh, I mean, there are many countries. They're making their sustainability brands. India called it Kasturi. It was interesting uh, to hear a colleague say that it is uh, musk, it is the dear musk, and we shouldn't associate it uh, indeed. I mean, that was also uh, my like initial reaction, but that's certainly not the end of the world. We need to create a brand. We need to create a sustainability brand, but based on sustainability principles. And for that, the ICAC can be immensely supportive. And India must participate uh, in the ICAC plenary with full strength to understand what is happening across the globe and then how to position ourselves. And we do provide a platform. It, it was very gratifying uh, to hear the textile commissioner, uh, uh, like Mrs. Ruprashi, ma'am. She picked up the phone. This was last week. And she was asking about the role of India in the ICAC plenary. I, was, I felt really happy because that is not a very common thing uh, when when our coordinating agencies ask us, what is our role? So India must take uh, the lead, uh, India must participate, India must understand the globe, but position itself as a leader because India has the largest area in the world and we cannot undermine its importance. It is, it, it is true that our productivity is low and we can always improve, but in terms of sustainability, there are many things that can be done for the soil. It is, in fact, biochar is happening a lot across the world. It's about carbon sequestration. There is so much. And I can, uh, I mean, I can assure on behalf of the ICAC, from the ICAC, that we are there with India. Of course, I am there with India, but the whole team will rally behind you. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Ganti. Uh, I think uh, you have mentioned very, uh, you highlighted very well that, uh, you know, the exchange of germplasm and uh, resources is very critical. Uh, you also mentioned about the branding. My next uh, uh, question to Dr. Silvaraj is, uh, are you there, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm there. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned about, uh, I think that struck me uh, immediately. You mentioned about our cotton quality sometimes is superior than Giza or Pima cotton. But those are the brands people know very well, even here. But we don't know our brands. And uh, Dr. Kramti talked about branding. What are your thoughts on branding being industry uh, representative as well? Sir, actually, <clears throat> Suvin was the best uh, ever cotton produced in the world. I think all of us will agree. Now, Suvin, there is a market volume. In fact, we were producing around uh, 50,000 bales a year. Now, we are producing only around 2,000. Now, we are closely working with uh, CACR and uh, Saima. We would like to uh, you know, uh, revive uh, Suvin and increase the production. That is number one. Number two, uh, as I already told you, uh, you know, CACR also has developed and Saima CDRA also has developed um, a cotton which is 
you know, um, uh, slightly superior to, I would say, Pima Giza, but we need to brand uh, all these cotton. Kasturi, as such, we are focusing only on uh, long staple cotton of 29 mm. But we need to develop uh, uh, brands for uh, ELS also. First of all, we have to do a lot of work on ELS. And uh, the first time, uh, I would say, in fact, uh, since uh, Dr. Kranti is there, he was the one, he rang the bell uh, in 2008-9. And uh, he is cautioned that India should come out with a technology mission on cotton. And we all jointly prepared a report, submitted to ministry. And of course, almost all, after 11, 12 years, now I think uh, we are making efforts because we started going down. So, so now I would uh, like to place on record the efforts taken by Ministry of Textiles, uh, especially our Honorable Minister and Ruprav Shri Ma'am, uh, and also Giant Secretary. Uh, in, in reviving all these things. In fact, very recently at the meeting, our Honorable Minister has requested us to submit uh, this uh, TMC2 because he, he also said that uh, mission mode approach is required. And we deal with about uh, 25,000 to 50,000 uh, rupees worth of cotton in four months. So definitely, and when the productivity doubles, it becomes very, very, very big. So the country's economy and industry's performance, which uh, you know, almost 75% uh, we account only cotton even today. And the industry's performance also greatly depends upon uh, the productivity, quality of uh, cotton, whatever we are talking. And to get value addition, definitely branding is required. And uh, we have come forward, uh, of course, through Texposal uh, to brand Indian cotton. Uh, and the city, Saima, we all will be backing uh, Texposal. And our Saima CD and RA also will be, city CDRA will play a pivotal role in uh, traceability and uh, sustainability of uh, cotton also. And for the first time, industry has come forward uh, to work with the uh, public-private uh, partnership mode. And also, uh, thanks to again, Honorable Minister, he has brought everybody under uh, uh, Suresh Kotak and found this uh, textile advisory group. And we have made a significant progress under this. And I'm very confident that going forward, uh, we'll be able to achieve uh, many results. Very recently, you know, Tamil Nadu, we consume about 45% of the cotton. Day for yesterday, we had a detailed meeting with our Honorable Chief Minister, who is, who is again showing a lot of interest to promote cotton in the state of Tamil Nadu. And we have already submitted a master plan to increase our cotton production from 5 lakh bales to 30 lakh bales in another 6 or 7 years. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think you mentioned about the technology mission. And I think that's a perfect uh, uh, segue to my question to Mr. Bhagirat. Uh, Bhagirat, uh, as uh, SABC has been working uh, significantly on the technological uh, awareness as well, uh, what technological measures you think are required to improve productivity uh, and production of cotton? Thank you, Sivinder. Um, you know, the projects that I just now highlighted in uh, my discussion about um, you know, management of pink bollworm in cotton uh, using innovative mating disruption technology uh, that we are collaborating with uh, multiple institutions while in implementing this program. This is one of the um, one of the technologies that are immediately available to us uh, to help farmer deal with uh, pink bollworm. But you know, I think broadly for seed and textile industry and for the different government ministries, given that there are challenges that are increasingly becoming big problem for farming community to produce quality cotton. I think it's our collective responsibility that we handhold farmers who produce cotton for us. We are at a inflection point. Our productivity dip is not, it can, it can be a disastrous. I can tell you with the kind of challenges that we see, uh, it, it can create problem for the country's availability of even 35 million bales in the years to come because the emergence of all the problems that I highlighted. So I think the first call of action that I would like to make here is that the government must look at what next that we can do in terms of seed technology so that farmer can continue to produce more cotton. The second, the call of action that I would like to propose here is that high density planting is a great idea and we must adopt it. But I think, you know, this is a very long-term plan. You are looking at converting 95% of the hybrid 
which covers close to 11 million hectares in the country to a very new system, which would require not only um, the planting material that you have uh, erect or uh, you know short duration, whatever the plant material that you need, it must have a BT in place. Right now we may have a BT, the first generation, but you need to have a herbicide tolerance because for farmer weeding become, will become hugely problem in very one leg plants per hectare. He will not be able to even enter and do the weeding. So one of the very important traits, if you want to make HTPS as a success, you need to get herbicide tolerant in it. You know, next one is that you need growth promoters. You know, you need to register these growth promoters, biostimulants. You need to register defoliants. You need to get machineries to do, uh, you know, one-time picking. More importantly, you need farmers, jo chode -chode kisan hai, jo char picking le rahe, jinko continuously, jinka livelihood, unki char picking pe depend karta, unko paisa milta hai, four times in a cropping system. You want that to be reduced to one. So unka jo mindset hai, usko change karna. That why this will be very helpful. So I would urge industry, I would urge CICR, textile ministry, let us begin with the existing germplasm or Volga 2 cotton hybrid that we have. Work on developing erect type where you can increase the plant population that currently we have 1,000, 10,000 uh, plant per hectare to 20,000 plant per hectare. You know, I think that would be, and farmer are going in that direction. They are increasing use of hybrid seed at from one packet to two packet to 2.5 packets. Okay, but you know, they don't have this whole mechanism where you can have a plant where you can do one time harvesting. So high density planting cannot be a panacea of the problem that we are facing. It would be a big mistake for us that we, we should go in that direction, but you know, it's a gradual process. And I believe, um, you know, country as a whole textile industry will massively increase our handholding of farming community. These are the points that I would like to highlight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bhagirath. And I think, uh, uh... Obviously, HDPS is a gradual phenomena and it's not going to take several years. Uh, and I open questions from the audience. Uh, uh, so if I can uh, see from the online as well, uh, there are a few online, uh, I could see hands raised and I need help to identify the people I can't read from here. Anyone can tell me. Uh, Mr. Okay, uh, so I'll, in the meantime, I can ask questions from the audience. Uh, so you have a question? Yes. Texas University uh, for the geographical area of Lebec. So I think uh, we can exchange notes with him. That's one part of it. Then another input or suggestion or question to Dr. Shukla of uh, Sircourt or Herswell CTRL is that, that uh, they have uh, developed technology to dis for disposal of parali. And that has become a big problem. So that should be available in public domain so that each and everyone can take care of it. Thank you. I think yours looks like a suggestion. It, uh, I think it's noted and can be acted. Thank you. The question is for Bhagiraji first and anybody else, uh, um, uh, you experts can answer. The cause and remedy of uh, ball rot. Cost and? Cause and remedy of ball rot. I, I think, you know, I would ask Dr. Um, uh, CICR director to really respond to it because we have been moving around in many fields and we have seen that the excessive rainfall has become a very big concern for the ball rot. But, sir, please. Uh, ball rot is it's a worldwide phenomenon. Every country faces, uh, because it's a so broad spectrum, this fungus. It's a group of fungi and bacteria. Internal bowl rot and external bowl rot. There are uh, remedial measures are uh, again manipulation. How you manage the humidity in the crop canopy. So again, canopy management comes into play, and how you actually in, uh, increase the plant population or the genotypes that are there, uh, especially, and how do you reduce the bo uh, load in the soil for bowl rot fungus uh, bacteria. 
for remedial measures, uh, because of the pesticide policy, antibiotics have been taken out of the pesticide spectrum. Like streptocycline sulfate was recommended I mean, by many universities for control of bold rot, which is an antibiotic for bacterial internal bold rot that has now been taken out of the uh, approved chemicals. So there is a, there is a gap. But till that time, we are relying on fungicides only, uh, like, for example, copper oxychloride or propiconazole or chrysoxymethyl and some other fungicides which are available. But they need to be applied at the appropriate time, and we need to educate the farmers. For non-BT in organic cotton, we don't have solution. But for conventional cotton, at 60 and 75 days, if you take up sprays, protective, protective sprays, uh, it is there. But and surprisingly, this has been a very wet season for uh, many locations. But uh, I have not come across bold rot so much this season compared to last year. So there is no clear cut. I mean, there is a lot of confusion. How I, I was expecting bold rot incidents 30% this time. I didn't find even one bowl also with bold rot, ex especially except in few locations in Telangana. That was the reason for asking. Since 2017, every year we are finding, last year we, we identified bold rot on 18th of August. And this year it has not come so, I mean, is it intermittent or is there any particular cost to it? That was the concern. Sir. Sir. Not on. <laughs> you only knew this. Uh, there are some varieties which are found to be showing less proneness to the bull rot. So that means the, the incidence of the bull rot is not uniform across the varieties since we are discussing about the breeding aspects in this session. So I think the breeders can select such varieties which have less bull rot compared to others. And that way I think it can, it can, uh, it, it can help to some extent. But as explained by Dr. Prasad, there, there cannot be a complete uh, cure to the problem. It is, it is related to the rainfall, late rains, particularly rainfall happening in October, can create this bold rot problem. Whenever there is a heavy rainfall, continuous rainfall, bold rot can happen. But by selecting for such varieties which have less tendency to have this problem, I think we can improve it to some extent. Best minds on stage right now. You you represent the seed industry. Dr. Prasad, the scientist industry, he represents the seed association. Can we have a data or do we actually have the data which which we which we can refer last five years? Pink ball worm, ball rot, uh, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, varieties, soil or uh, weather. My related. comment is based on the data only. So we have noted that some varieties are better than others. So therefore, we have to choose them and use them. Now, now today. The farmers have access to so many varieties, so they also know which varieties are. This is not a stage to give the names of the varieties, but there are some which are better than others. Yeah, I think uh, we can uh, continue discussion. There are some uh, online questions as well. Uh, one from Mr. Barua, Raji Barua. So you have a question? Yes, sir. I just have uh, two very uh, uh, quick comments. One is on the technology transfer. You know, we, we're having a lot of discussion on the development of technology, which can happen at a fairly good pace. But I think we are really suffering because our technology transfer is quite weak. Uh, a recent report by Terry states that there are only four full-time uh, researchers for 100,000 farmers. So how are we going to plug this gap of knowledge transfer? I know, you know, Dr. Prasad and many people in the room are, you know, very well aware of the problem. Uh, the second point I just wanted to reiterate, and I, since, uh, you know, the, the important people from the textile ministry here, I just want to echo what Dr. Kranti said that we need to create a sustainable brand for Indian cotton. Otherwise, there are some great initiatives uh, on the globe they will occupy a large percentage of the area. And the third point is actually a direct question maybe to Dr. Prasad is, you know, and, you know, we did speak about the HTBT uh, going to be released, uh, but we, we just had an announcement, a contradictory announcement that glyphosate is going to be banned. With the ban of glyphosate, in two days time, we had an announcement that HTBT is going to be released. 
So how does how do these two sort of uh, match together? And I just also want to quickly say on the ping bollworm issue, uh, you know, quoting from a recent report of Dr. Kranti is that ping bollworm can be managed and, not controlled. and managed literally means that the knowledge transfer to farmers really has to be a top. Thank you. So you would like to respond to the question or no, he's asking about HTBT and banning of glyphosate here. Regarding HTBT and then uh, uh, it is not yet announced. Only the subcommittee has submitted its report to GEAC. The announcement is still not yet come. We don't know the exact status. Still, we are grappling with the GM mustard story. So it will come and it will be viewed as it when it comes, that announcement from the government side. Second is the glyphosate ban. Especially glyphosate is banned for public use. Especially it is in cropped, cropped area. It, is, it was permitted till recently for non-cropped area and in tea gardens. So the recent circular is again uh, uh, taking out glyphosate for use in tea gardens especially, but it applies in cropped area, it's still not permitted. So this chicken and egg story, this is, if uh, HTBT is allowed, there will be a mechanism to again uh, permit or register glyphosate for use in cotton. If that doesn't happen, then these two these are again uh, twin sides of the same coin. So without each side, it cannot happen. This has to go hand in hand. How we resolve this, uh, time will tell. Uh, uh, I, I, I want to, uh, Sivinder, if you permit, I, would, I just want to add to what Dr. Prasad has said. So, okay. sure. you know, I just want to clarify that, you know, glyphosate is not being banned. This is just a misinformation. What government has done is that they said that the glyphosate use can be only through pest control operators. So wherever glyphosate has a label, like in tea gardens or not non-cropped area, where farmers used to go and buy and use through their NEPSEC spray. Now what government has come out uh, with is that you can still buy from the market, but you know the application of glyphosate has to be through the registered PCOs. It's called pest control operators. Now, given that the pest control operator doesn't exist in anywhere in rural part of the country, everyone is facing the problem and there is a lot of confusion. Uh, I think the government of Maharashtra, if I understand, um, they have been deliberating on it and they are facing huge problem what will happen to the winter crop because of the uh, late uh, rain and so much uh, weeds that are there in you know, pre-planting of the crop. So I want to clarify that there is no ban it's just that the use has to be through PCO. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bagheer, for clarification. And we'd like to go on, but I think uh, we are really pressed for time. So, any concluding uh, comments the chair would like to have, and then we close the session. Thank you. So, I think we had a much longer session than what perhaps was programmed because some of the speakers went uh, on and on. <laughs> and some of them even digressed from the topic that was specifically mentioned about the um, cotton breeding for efficient use of genetic resources. That was the topic, but I think people went much beyond that. Um, I think uh, many of the uh, uh, presentations and the uh, discussions were need not be repeated, but I would like to just clarify one aspect. Some of the wrong impressions and fallacies that, were, that are there in the industry were reflected in the uh, talk of Selvaraj. He was talking about um, truthful level seed, seed quality. Probably this is, there is a misinformation that is there in the textile industry. Since I am from the seed industry, I need to clarify that point. Therefore, I chose to respond to that. The seed quality is well regulated by the seed companies themselves. And of course, uh, it is also overseen by the state governments as well as the government of India. Government of India makes the seed quality standards. They notify from time to time, time to time as per the Seeds Act. And uh, it is monitored 
and regulated by the state governments in every state. So that is the list of the problem. There are many problems which we need to address and resolve. Uh, re similarly, there was a comment again made by Bhagirat about high density planting. Nobody is recommending farmers to go for one lakh plants per acre right away. It is a journey we have to do. The journey we have to start increasing the population by 20%, 25%. That too, in uh, poor soils, perhaps the opportunity is more. We can increase the population more. So it, it cannot be one fits every one kind of a recommendation given by anybody. So the one lakh is the ultimate goal, which somebody else has done and we can also do. But to start with, it will be like, you know, 25-30% uh, increase of the population. And uh, at the same time, we also will have breeding of varieties that is, that is going to happen. I don't imagine a situation where hybrids will be used forever in our country. Producing of hybrid seed is very difficult, very labor-oriented task. And uh, taking up uh, hybrid seed production to meet the seed demand when the population goes to one lakh plant per acre is going to be impossible. So varieties are going to come in our country also. But there is a lot more work has to be done by the breeding uh, companies and breeding institutes like CSCR to develop appropriate varieties. Selvaraj himself is saying about Saima coming up with varieties, but nobody is taking them because they are not giving same yield like hybrid. And CSCR also has got some 19 varieties which they are testing, but they are not able to match the performance of the hybrids. There are many things that are required to be done. Ultimately, it will happen. But today, we are not ready with a variety that can replace the existing hybrids. So these are some of the things which we have to understand. And any, com any adverse comments can actually derail the whole program. Any adverse comment on high density planting can derail the whole program. Similarly, an advocacy of varieties replacing hybrids also can derail the, the existing HDP uh, discussions which we are doing. So it is a, a, kind, a, it's a combination, it's an integrated approach where we try to combine all the bring them together and move forward. So that's all I would like to say and uh, sum up the discussion here. Thank you very much for your patience. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rao. I think with permission of chair, I'd like to close the session and thanks to everyone for their patience and all. Thank you so much.